of our hearts and minds be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So today is the first Sunday of Epiphany. It's a celebration of the baptism of Jesus. And so when the wise men finally got to the, to the manger, when did they get there? Two years later, right? We know that because in Matthew it says that Herod wanted to kill all of the kids um, two years and younger, all the male boys two years and younger to give, eradicate the threat of the new coming king. So, but this reading this morning has nothing to do with either of these two special events, right? We get Jesus walking along the sea and disciples of John saying, look, it is the Lamb of God. And Jesus sees two of these disciples following after him, and he turns around and he looks at him and he says, what does he say? Did he say who? What are you looking for? How many of you would like to have Jesus come and stand before you and say, what are you looking for? How many of you would know how to answer that question? Or would you be like the disciples of John in our reading this morning, who kind of fumble a little bit, I think, and don't answer very quickly, or with a question, with a question that actually is something they want to know. But what did the disciples ask then? Where are you staying? <laughs> staying. Y'all remember Christmas Eve morning, right? Advent 4. How many of you were here for Advent 4 worship service? Don't, I, you know, this isn't a shaming kind of thing. I'm just wondering. So I wonder how much I have to, to repeat what I said that morning. Um, <laughs> right? That morning we talked about the reading was the first part of the first of the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And there was nothing that was created that wasn't created by Him. And, and it came to... And the Word became flesh and did what? Dwelt among us. And that word for dwell, confirmation students, actually means what? <laughs> they're not going to, Bill's like, they're not going to remember. Do you remember, Bill? Carrie's back there raising her hand. She knows. What is it? Tent, right. It literally means to, like, come and take up residence and to be intimately with. It's not like, it's not like he wants you to sit on the same bench with him. Jesus is going to come and pitch a tent and stay in your house forever. He's going to come and live with you forever. He's going to abide with you. So the word that these disciples say to Jesus is, where are you abiding. And in much of the way that Jesus does most of the answering of the questions, he, he, does he actually answer their question? No. It would have been real nice if Jesus would have said, well, I'm staying over on Mulberry Street at, at 241. If you want to see me, you need to come around the back of the house and knock on the door in the back because the front door doesn't lead to the apartment that I'm staying in. Right? That would have been an actual answer to their question. Where are you staying? Where are you dwelling? But Jesus says to them, Now follow me. What does he say? Come and see. These are very important words. I want to hear everybody say them. Jesus says to the disciples, Come and see. Come and see. And what do they do? They go with Jesus and they stay with him. They actually stay with him for a day, it says. And then the next day they were out walking again. Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he sees Philip. Right? And he says to Philip, follow me. And he calls Philip, and Philip comes and follows him. And then Philip goes and finds who? There's a couple other people in between here that I left out. Not, that, not because they're not important, but because. Just because. So Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. And he says to Nathaniel, We have found the Messiah. Right? We have found the one that Moses said is going to come and is going to save us all. And he's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says... Can anything good come from Nazareth? Now think for a moment. And, and insert city of choice here. As I was sitting over here um, listening to the reading, as Nelda was reading it, and I was waiting to sing with the choir, I was thinking, I would get up here and I'd ask you, show of hands, who's from the east side of Green Bay? And who's from the west side of Green Bay? 
And what did you think about those who were on the opposite side of the river? <laughs> right? If you heard that you, if you were on the west side of Green Bay and you heard that somebody was dating somebody from the east side of Green Bay, that was immediately just the worst thing that that person could ever do in their life. Right? Because they're from the wrong side of the river and nothing good comes from that other side of the river. Right? That's exactly the tone that they had here of, of Nathaniel and people from Nazareth. Because Nazareth, you see, was probably about 60% Jewish population. The rest of it was a mix of Romans and different nationalities. And the Jews that lived in Nazareth were known to intermarry. They were known to marry non-Jews. They were known to do things that weren't weren't supposed to be done according to our religion. They didn't follow all of the, the Levitical laws. They didn't do the right things in the temple. They didn't worship the right way. These were people that, that other Jews, the Jews in Jerusalem, looked down upon because they came from someplace. And if we're actually all honest with ourselves, we all know that when we hear about that one place, we all go, oh, really? You're from there? I'm so sorry. <laughs> Or we think less of a person because they come from that place, right? If you're honest with yourself, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or, or nod your head here. I'm just asking you to think inside of your own heads and to be honest with yourself and say, yeah, there's that one place when I hear that somebody's from there, I don't like that. And that's exactly where Nathaniel was. And Philip could have gone, well, like, you know, let's give this guy a chance. Maybe, you know, he's from Nazareth, but, you know, maybe, maybe he grew up with the right parents or maybe he had the right... Nathaniel didn't say any of that. Because you know Nathaniel had already met Jesus. Or Philip had already met Jesus, sorry. Philip didn't say any of that to Nathaniel. Philip could have argued with Nathaniel about how Jesus maybe had the right upbringing and Jesus had the, all the right stuff, even though he was from Nazareth. Let's not hold that against him. But Philip didn't do any of that. Because Philip had already met Jesus. Philip already knew who Jesus was. Philip already knew the impact that Jesus had on his life. Because Jesus invited him. Jesus actually commanded him to follow me. And Philip did. And he stayed with Jesus. He abided with Jesus. And instead of arguing with Nathaniel, when they got to that point of Nathaniel saying that, what did Philip say to him? Those, those three words, what did Philip say? Everybody, come and see. Come and see. Right? Philip didn't argue with Nathaniel. He didn't try to tell him all of the things that were going to happen in his life and how his life was going to be so much better. Philip only said to Nathaniel, come and see. Because Philip knew that when Nathaniel came, that he was going to meet Jesus. And that's all that ever needed to happen. You see, in Jesus, in this first question, when the disciples walk after him and they say to him, where are you staying? Right? What are you looking for? Jesus says to them, and they say, where are you staying? Where are you abiding? And Jesus says, come and see. There's some scholars that say Jesus never actually had a home during all of his ministry. And he just used the resources of other people. He never had a place to abide. He never had a place to remain. And it was always on the, the, the resources of somebody else that he was staying in their house. Or he was staying in this place because somebody was allowing him to. The only place that Jesus ever actually abides in the Gospel of John is many weeks later from now, actually 40 days after Easter. Anybody know what happens 40 days after Easter? 50 days is Pentecost. 40 is when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. And the only place in the Gospel of John that Jesus ever abides is when he ascends into heaven and remains with God. As he tells us in John chapter 14, that, that's probably been read at many funeral sermons you've been at. And it talks about, I have gone to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. There are many dwelling rooms. What's the word there? Abiding places. The word in John actually says, in the, my Father's house there are many places to 
abide. And I go and prepare a place for you to abide. You're going to be there forever. And that's the only place that Jesus ever abides. It stays in the Gospel of John. And these disciples are invited on a lifelong journey. And Jesus says to them, come and see where I am staying. Come and see where I am remaining. Come and see what is happening. Because Christianity... I saw this quote this morning and I thought, i got to fit this in here someplace. Brian McLaurin um, said, Is the Christian faith a pathway, a, lot, a way of life... Or is, a parking, or is it a parking lot, a warehouse, a system of belief, and a system of sin management and death preparation? Let me read that one more time. Is the Christian faith a pathway, a way of life, or is it a parking lot, a warehouse, a system of belief, and a system of sin management and death preparation? If we are about living the life that Jesus has called us to, living in the life that you've been invited into, living in that place where Jesus has said to you, come and see what is happening, and come and see what I can do for you, then it's not about living life the right way, or preparing to be in the right place, or doing the right thing so that we get to the right place after we die. It's about living a life the way that Jesus has called us to live it. It's about living a life the way that Jesus has led us to live it. It's about being that out in the world, and that's not a star, by the way, it is a star, but it's a light, right? It's about being this, right here. This is what it's all about. And it's not about it, about our light. It's not about the light that we turn on and off. It's truly, truly actually about this light, right here, right? That light that's lit when you're put under the water, or the water is poured over your head, and the light is lit off of that light right there. Because that's the light that Christ shines in and through every one of us. And just as Jesus said to those disciples that came from John, he says to each and every one of us, he says, come and see. And then as he invited Philip to follow him, he invites each and every one of us to follow him. And to not leave it at that, but to go and to find Nathaniel. Because we all know a Nathaniel, right? Who's going to question everything. You've got one in your life who doesn't understand why you're a Christian, who doesn't understand why you come to worship every Sunday morning. You've got at least one. You're not supposed to tell them that I go to worship because God makes my life right. I go to worship because that's what I'm supposed to do. I go to worship because then I'm saved from hell. I go to worship because of all these things. You don't need to do any of that. All you need to do is do what Philip did to Nathaniel. I found the Messiah. Come and see. And let them figure it out for themselves. So the three most important words that you can ever say to somebody is... Come and see. So this morning, Jesus invited you... To follow him on a life journey. To see exactly where it is that he's abiding. To live in a, in a pathway, a way of life. Not to worry about doing things right. Not to worry about pleasing anybody else. But coming along with him. And journeying with him to his cross. And through his cross. And throughout into the world to show them the life. And to find those that he's sending you to find. And to invite them along to this journey too. Not to try to convince them because that's not your job. That's not our job. God will do all of that. All you have to do is invite them to. Amen. So go and tell them, tell the world to come and see.